for a period of time in Le Corbusier's office. And then following that came to the United States and was for a time uh, at Taliesin with Frank Lloyd Wright. And then uh, finally to Chicago, in Skid Mowings and Merrill, after which he established his own practice in San Francisco. So here he is. Patrick Clay. Thanks very much. Um, we have uh, uh, been chatting, uh, Eric and I have been chatting since uh, my airplane arrived in a car. We've been driving on the freeway, it seems, continually. We've not stopped talking, you know, since about five o'clock, something like that. And at this point, uh, I'm not exactly certain, you know, what the hell I'm doing here. <laughs> <laughs> but what I, wanted, what I want to do is to have as much as possible at least a dialogue, you know, and you can look upon me as some kind of uh, material, you know, that is here for, for a while, and you can uh, shoot at me, you can do it, I have this thing, you can do anything, you know, and I am here, I'm told that the subject of my lecture is to be in defense of offense, and that is something which I have, these are words a little bit strange to my own mouth, actually, because um, I want that uh, the architecture uh, does all that, you know. Uh, I would like very much to uh, really start with the very concrete world that architecture is to me, um, not so much a paper world, not so much a talking world. But um, the fundamental communication being in terms of concrete, and I use con concrete not necessarily as the material, but as the manifestation of something. And now because I'm not so much like a s student a anymore in terms of having an idea and wanting to build it, it's possible for me to do something of the reverse and that is to having built something, you know, testing it, let, letting it come back, so there's a feedback. The, the sometimes one has the idea, uh, and many, many great people have that, you know, you have the theory and then you make the theory manifest. Um, I'm going to run through some slides just to kind of warm up. And uh, just, these are feedback, what I call kind of feedback slides. This is not as a building was intended or presented to a client or anything of the kind. But as, uh, as I see it now, so looking back, and then I'd like then to go into some very profound and, and wide sweeping thoughts, you know, and share these then with you, and then go on and look at some of the things that are on the, on the drawing board now and what goes on into the future. So I'll start right in the middle. If I could have the lights out, like the first slide. While this is happening, um, uh, I would like to say that uh, there are, in San Francisco, um, many fantastic opportunities which uh, I feel have been very much overlooked in the general run of I say the history of architecture. There haven't been, uh, you could say it has been very much the uh, Bay Region residential world that, uh, fr from which things have grown. And then more recently, the large commercial firms have come in, moved in. I am very, very much uh, an individual person. I don't have a partner, for example. And uh, so almost everything goes out, comes out from my, my hand, and I'll take the consequences of it. This is, uh, for me, uh, you could say, a 
an extraordinary uh, a feeling that uh, people uh, use uh, a wall, or people use a floor, or people use a space. And uh, I have found out that uh, the rooftop is an extremely significant part of architecture in that people feel more liberated there than in any other place. And in a city like San Francisco, it's perfectly possible to make, uh, have re established relationships, for example, between uh, moments in history. We'll come back into this, this thing about history. But this is, here, this is Alcatraz and beyond it, Angel Island. And these things are just simply related in space and they are intended like that that there would be walls and spaces in which people can relate uh, in their own way. You see, some things like uh, furniture, for example, there's one piece of furniture here, which I find there, which obviously proves very useful. And uh, otherwise, uh, if you design a table, and you see, this is a, a really quite an unconventional way of sitting. <laughs> and you can't, uh, there's a wonder about architects who do all things by programs and so on. They think something's programmed and it's designed in a certain way to fulfill a certain program. That if one could come back and see human beings more or less like nature in a way. And I want to see this because I don't think that it's a complete photograph of any architecture that doesn't have people in it. And without going into the reasons for this building or the reasons for these steps or, 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 or anything like that, uh, to come back and say there is no particular reason, um, but uh, human beings place themselves, and from that one can discover something. Again, it's very difficult to build the, ex the unknown into a program. You can't do it. But I did watch, I did observe how people used this particular building, how it, w how it related uh, to other parts of the city. Again, there's uh, um, Koita. And uh, how people use things as they were not intended to be used. And then I made that the basis of the next work. In other words, if I hadn't built this, I would not be able to do the next thing that, that I, I will show you. Uh, there is, at the time this was built, this is the San Francisco Art Institute, I should say a few things like that. This is a, a lecture hall on two levels and so on. But that doesn't seem to me so important anymore. The important thing is that there is a relationship, a dialogue with the city there. There's a dialogue with the people. And uh, in that uh, dialogue, it has come back to me. And uh, it has come back to me what should be done next time. In other words, I feel I, I am detached. Uh, the people there, they don't know me. I was taking photographs, you know, and they thought I was a tourist or something like that. It has uh, uh, a dialogue with an older building. There, there is uh, the old Art Institute, which is Spanish style. Uh, the tower is uh, a kind of Mediterranean event. And it was all built in concrete, so there was a relationship, you see, to bring in concrete again. There was an excuse. That's not the point. The point is that in order to have a historical relationship, or a rhythmic relationship, or a relationship of materials, or any of those things. You don't have to follow these half-baked formulas of re, uh, I say, regurgitating a previous style in any way whatsoever. And the, the fact that there are, uh, are rhythms of a job to be done, these are various studios arranged in the old building, and I've got certain rhythms of jobs to be done in, in the new building, a different function entirely. The old building is a time in which the idea of an artist was uh, maybe little, very little uh, oil paintings or busts, small things, you have a little art class around in a circle. And the new building is uh, a welding steel uh, uh, forming I I enormous things and making a general mess. An automobile repair garage would have done the job just as well. But time has come in now. It's no longer such an outrageous thing. Ivy has grown in there, and it's come, instead of being, uh, as it was considered at that time, a rather violent thing on the landscape, and it w in San Francisco there was nothing at that time when 
uh, concrete was a, as a raw material, which is, you see everywhere now. In those days, it wasn't everywhere. But the, uh, so nature comes in, again in a, in a way, unplanned, and the, there is a general, uh, how do you say, picking up of the mood of, of, of the world, and this happens to be a certain kind of San Francisco world, which makes it now, I suppose you could say, a kind of romantic place. Not intended as a romantic place, as the Acropolis in Athens was not intended as a romantic place. It happens to be like that because of the ruins, or as we see it. Now, all of this becomes, in a way, a kind of romantic place, like an old castle you come across, which, which was designed with the intent of being absolutely, f absolutely fresh and, and really quite, quite startling. So this is, uh, well, this is an apartment, actually. It is built in there not intended to be romantic. And the relationship between the, uh, the new structure on the left and an ancient, earlier structure on the right, rather, sudden glimpses of the city in between the two, is something which, according to the rules, would be thoroughly frowned upon. You see, you're meant to always, I don't know, hide a new, new, new structure. This is brought alongside like a great boat. You know, it almost touches. and. Uh, the, but it has not subtracted from the old building. You know, what qualities there are in it. The fact that the space is narrow, the fact that it's tight, the fact that the old building, in a way, assimilates old world craftsmanship, and the new building is a kind of, uh, well, it was a spontaneous and rather rough uh, development of the, uh, of the surface. But. What I want to say is that in time, now coming back, it doesn't look violent anymore. At that time, it was a confrontation, really, of two, two worlds. Not that one is against the other. From this, and from feedback from that, it was possible to go on to a larger scale job. Now, this is a very interesting thing, and I don't think that many people do that. And that is by having a firm enough base and conviction in one's own work, you can modify it or move on to a larger scale. You can attempt to do things, you have more courage, more certainty, perhaps, you know? You can handle larger budgets with more, with more care and so on. But this is uh, 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 San Francisco State, uh, again, uh, a, a kind of key place in San Francisco, and some relating in a different way, but again to uh, people, unconventional people in a way going through that period that you're going through already, I suppose. It's, it's, uh, a, a world or a community that is independent from the normal patterns of business and living and so on, and at, constructed at a time in which uh, there's a tuning in to a challenge of consciousness, you know what that meant, what the different levels of consciousness were, uh, finding a new society, a new world and so on. The elevations, these uh, truncated pyramids have uh, four or five floors within them inside one is dedicated to silence and another one to sound, came out of the student participation in, in what would be the various levels of achievement one would like to find. So without a particularly clear program, but with a certain persuasive and necessarily persuasive vocabulary with the uh, chancellor's office and with the trustees to use certain funds and build around the ordinary projects, the ordinary projects of restaurants and bookstores, meeting rooms and so on, and to develop that into an anchor or into an educational place, an educational place, something which is demanding something of one, uh, to understand it. Uh, I can explain, explain the pattern of it. At the moment, I really am most interested in how people relate. We had um, a large AIA convention in Newport Beach and everyone showing slides and talking very, very much about humanity and so on. None of the slides that people are talking about humanity showed any human beings, always deserted buildings. <laughs> and I found out now this is extremely important to see that human beings are not necessarily what one has in the back of one's mind at all, but, but behave in an absolutely beautiful and unpredictable way. But also, are not, anyone is really too far away from nature and you see, distribute themselves about more or less perhaps as birds would, you know, uh, spacing themselves and so on. These are not programmed things. But anyway, the general experience is there. 
and it is, of course, it's bound together with a, the, uh, there's an underlining pattern, and there's, a, there's some difficult engineering problems and so on. But by moving around the building, one has unending surprises, and those surprises lend themselves, I think, to a certain amount of human curiosity. The one can't grasp a facade, for example, or say this is the front or this is the back. Uh, so this unprogrammed world, in a way, is a kind of turn-on that children really appreciate. Uh, they're very young children who have not had any architectural education at all, just run around because it's thoroughly alive. They're just turned on by the excitement of general space. You can always do that and make that an excuse, you know. But the thing that I would hope for, in a way, would be that one could take various things which are, yeah, they're, they, they are functions, they're stairs, or they're columns, or walls that enclose things. And with those elements, uh, create a, a, a world that has an incredible variety as the sun comes into it, and as people relate in different ways at different times of the day, and through different years, and theoretically through different epochs. Uh, to explain the building is simply a triangulated plan and has triangulated beams, and they're supported by columns on angles resisting the earthquake and, um, well, uh, some of the basic elements. The uh, roof drainage, of course, is a long trough which is suspended from the underside and eventually d deposits water down there. Sometimes the triangles are infilled with uh, windows, and I suppose you could call anti-windows, these things with colors in, you can't look through, the glasses around the edge, filling in in different ways, but keeping that same pattern, that basic structural system, absolutely evident, without overplaying it, without making it just too goddamn obvious, and then pulling out from that, what I have a hyperbolic paraboloid wall, is, is this curved plaster uh, job that goes around, allows light to come in from up above, Perhaps one's not playing with windows. Sometimes there are windows, but in general it's just light and openings and scale and surprises. But I think staying with a basic vocabulary um, and laying it out for that, uh, that particular job. Um, the under, the under construction before the people come in, I shouldn't be showing such things. But when people are there, there is a human scale, and this is a thing that is always present on and, and every drawing, on every model, on every building. The height of one's eye, the height of one's elbow, uh, are fundamentally important things. One of the biggest lessons that I, I learned from Le Corbusier was it was not only the matter of the, uh, the large-scale operations which are extremely necessary for an architect to be able to command, but that there is a contrast of scale, it, always. And that, that contrast of scale brings the hu human element in, into play. So at any rate, there's a contrast. There's people sitting down there on the wall, light coming down from the top of the wall. So the basic elements are there, the trough running through there, the idea of a wall being, well, a curtain, an enclosure, something like that. You can't quite call it a curtain wall, but it's obviously not supporting things. To the right, the, those are the vigorous structures. And um, that's where the systematic part of the engineering is. Uh, so uh, the true same thing with the mechanical system. This this thing that looks like a, um, a funnel standing up there. There's several of them going around the building. The raw steel uh, um, where resists the resist the temptation to paint them, you know, and leave them raw, and they. <coughs> It then become, in a way, a kind of language. They stand there. It could be, I don't know, armor or um, Egyptian gods or something like that. You translate it. The function is there. I don't know whether it is functional. Uh, but it, there is, I suppose, you could say, a, a form of sculpture. And um, you can build these things, in a way, into well, what in this case has become a kind of forest. The light kind of comes in there at different times of the day. Um, I have introduced bright colors where I feel it is necessary as, uh, well, as screens, really, or things to do with space. The structural members, I would never paint a color. I want to keep those rugged and strong. 
Um, so uh, inside, well, inside the pyramidal structures are a kind of space frame made of two pipes and uh, becomes a slightly different system because it must be much lighter, really. Uh, the roof and the walls and the floors are all held together within one system. So it's a bit more of a ship-like situation. The scale is different as one goes up in different levels. Um, there are some things become kind of complicated. They're not intended to that, and I think in plan they're really not. The windows or lights are from above, looking down as they bring light in from above as much as possible. Um, the, uh, this thing of a window is also to me a, a kind of interesting thing. I suppose a window, the first meaning of the word window is a wind hole, a hole the wind comes in so you can breathe well, you know. Now it's different things, we break it down different ways. It's, it's the light where you see the sky, you can tell it's raining, the sun's up, so you look up there. There is the sun coming in on, on, on uh, a, a wall, which to me is an extremely important thing. And then there's the air coming in from the outside, which comes through this funnel, of course. So they're all things are differentiated very much from the, the old idea of a window. Um, the normal things, of course, of, uh, um, uh, 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 from a boiler and, well, the incline uh, is an important thing. I found out that that um, the stability, the centralized stability of the, the pyramids of Egypt, for example, is a very essential part of a, of a classic uh, world. And uh, we have got the opportunities for certain eccentricity, which um, happens in times of earthquake, of course, but also in terms of um, playing with uh, the space and the adventurous feeling of a human being. Uh, inside with some spaces, uh, it happens to be in a bookstore, it could be, a, could be really any other function. I take it as a universal space, it works well as a, as a bookstore. But uh, introducing um, uh, color in certain ways, and again these are uh, uh, windows for vision, the little offices in there opening out in different ways. It's not quite up for some reason. Yeah. Well, to go back to this thing about uh, a human being and uh, how a person relates and whether it is a cruel world that, it, that I'm in, imposing, you know, as, uh, as some of my colleagues have felt. I have not built any buildings yet that have pitched roofs and shingles on them and all the nice human things uh, that one should have or do. But I love humanity. I just absolutely love it. I think humanity is the inspiration of architecture. And in uh, uh, how uh, uh, the assembly is an extremely important part. Uh, I think that it's not just what one does as a room inside, but you can build an architecture as a room outside. I like that very much. Is it because it's easier to photograph? But the room out, where does architecture begin or end? I think it extends with the people. The human beings become the material. I think human beings are the material of architecture. And as that material extends, um, this is a forum, uh, such as, as, as we ha have in here in a way. There's some, some political thing taking place there. Where there's normal things, I'd say, uh, that from uh, the background of Le Corbusier, obviously a two-story high door that's a pivoted open there. And uh, um, where well, I, I learned also the importance that the architect really must, must uh, uh, be, be a painter as well as a sociologist or whatever that is. And with people, uh, there is, uh, of course, the element of color coming in, which mustn't be overlooked, and the element of the street. That a single building, this is a single intact building, it becomes, in a way, a street. The street's a great thing. Uh, it's one of the things that is, uh, uh, lessons to me in, that it can happen in, in the United States of America, in San Francisco. Outside of my office is a perpetual street, a street of people all the time interesting, colorful things happening. And uh, that is one of the materials of, of, of San Francisco, I feel. It kind of returns into itself. Um, the uh, street is, of course, not just a place where people walk through or park cars. No cars come close to this building. But a place where people exchange things, make things, you see? 
sell things, and uh, it do, you don't prevent them from doing that. The fact that is, I said, many people may criticize, I go back in the defense of offense subject matter, that the individuals here, are, uh, they have this thing imposed upon them, this overwhelming thing. It's not the case at all, it's a kind of turn on scene. It makes a background that they can do their thing any way you like. It doesn't subtract, it creates in a way. And there is, so there is this life, this street life, that one can come back uh, and visit and then extend in one's new work, you see. But I think, in a way, I do it as a supportive thing. That is the color, the texture. I, uh, in architecture, what is it? You know, is it a theater? You know, is it a subtracted environment or drafting board? You know, where does it begin? Where does it end? I don't know. I, I want to find out. And find out by building, really. If I give everybody a little store, a place where they can do their thing, it doesn't mean, say, it all has to be made kind of cute for them. You know, they'll do their thing. They will if they're selling shoes or they're selling flowers. They come in, they're selling fruit. You know, if they're Chinese, if they're, they're black or white, doesn't matter. You, they, you don't have to make it all cute for them. You give them the frame, you see, and then let them come in, let them do their thing, and, and uh, take it with a certain degree of, you know, of grace and, and, and uh, consistency. And, uh, and you draw out, you make a stage, really. I think that's, that's to me, really important part of it. Um, I don't believe, obviously, uh, we can go into this, I don't believe that an architect uh, should be so self-effacing, you know, that uh, he, he's, he's championed because he's actually done nothing. I do feel it's terribly important that architect is an artist, and he, he should not deny that, he must present that, and learn when to do that, and when to step back, but do both, you know. And um, I say I'm very interested in this, this whole matter, I make these paintings, uh, and, and uh, uh, we make that uh, an element. I don't ask for a vote. You know, what's everyone going to do? I'll let everyone have an opportunity to do their thing. I do my thing. And I make a, a porcelain painting uh, on a wall. The wall is an integral part of the building and is consistent, and I know how it should be consistent because I happen to be the architect also. And I'm interested that one can, uh, uh, in architecture, uh, not be so entirely bound by the rules of that world that the communication with the other artists, and I'll get into this later, the communication with painters is so lacking because one has not had the experience of being a painter, of not, not, one has not had that contact. Um, that as architects, we've got to start le learning from the painters, we've got to start learning from the sculptors, and, and, and move out of this, this kind of trap that the profession has got itself into, that you can't, nothing's acceptable unless it's uh, uh, self-effacing. Um, I'd like to have the lights, and we take a break, and, and maybe discuss things. Yeah, if we have the room lights, I'm going to show you some more slides later on, but hold now. Um, I do this as kind of introductory thing, and I like, uh, maybe we have some, so anyone has some questions or something on their mind, you know, or can help me by criticizing, I really would love it, I, or anything, just um, anybody has anything to say, yeah. Yes, was there a question? No. Frank thought right. This, thank you. This is a nice question. It doesn't show up, does it, very much, though. Um, I'd like to kind of remove the picture on the scene there. Uh, uh, Wright, um, uh, to, to me, he's a, he's a man, a great, great, one of the great uh, Americans uh, of the, um, I suppose you could say, of the 19th century, and who was living, still living when I was a student, uh, sort of. and. Um, it would have been absolutely ridiculous, I felt, to be living at that particular period and not have a contact with that man. And he was very good to me, uh, I must say that. Um, it, with the life there in Taliesin was lacking the, the um, uh, intellectual vitality that I was accustomed to in my own background, and, um, uh, which was probably quite good for me because I had to turn to other things. But uh, Wright had 
this concept of America. And, and this, this is the thing I was talking with Eric, you know, that there was a time in which an architect could have a concept about what America should be, you know. That's a tremendous thing. And uh, that was going back, of course, into to Whitman and, and, and a lot of uh, uh, um, early, uh, earlier background uh, and uh, carried on through Louis Sullivan and so on. And that's that whole stream and there's a living example. That man's still alive, you know, even if his work has gone rotten or whatever it is. You know, there he is, you know. And as a human being, he was a lovely human being doing just, to me, absolutely atrocious things, you know. So I keep my mouth shut and I learn as much as I possibly can. And, uh, he, and there, was, there were two or three things there from which it profoundly affected me. One was the um, introduction to America, because he was my introduction to America. Uh, and uh, um, the other one was the relationship of architecture to landscape, you know. That's the thing which everybody learned from, by the way. I've had, had that, that um, uh, confession from, both from Le Corbusier and from Mies van der Rohe. They both learned a tremendous amount from Frank Lloyd Wright, how he could relate a building to the landscape, you know, they, they do it differently. That is a tremendously important thing. And uh, experience more, I felt a little bit more in Arizona than in, in Wisconsin. One thinks away all the, all the, all the, the, the sentimentality, all of the um, all, uh, false ornamentation and so on, uh, the superficialities, you think that away, you don't hold, hold on that. And then uh, someone who is close to building, and I, th I felt that's really important. Uh, learning, I learned a little bit of masonry, I must say that, a little bit of agriculture. I learned some of these, these kind of funda very fundamental earthy things, which was just very, very good for me at that time and you know, sobered me up in very, very many ways. I don't know if that answers exactly. Obviously, I don't fo didn't follow many people who go to right there, uh, maybe don't have, didn't have the strength or something like that, and they go on doing for the rest of their lives what he was doing in a two-year period, you know. Uh, you have, that that hap happened, of course, a lot. Um, as a community, very disappointing community, Italianism to me would have been, had a had beautiful, you know, romantic ring to the word, and, and I saw so many, conjured up so many good things, and it was such a terrible, terrible disappointment on, of uh, course, on an intellectual level, and, uh, because the whole thing kind of um, evaporated from the scene as far as my own work is concerned. I don't think that answers the question. Yeah. More questions? <laughs> yes? Will you elaborate a little bit on learning from painters and sculptors? Uh, yes, I'd like to do that. Um, uh, well, during really good e epochs in history, I just feel that they are very close together. Um, in this true, in the, in obviously in the classic period in Greece and in, in um, throughout the Middle Ages, there's, there is this wonderful relationship in the, in, the, in the cathedral, obviously there's a complete understanding of what these people are doing. And we have recognized it that in the early part of this century in which there were, uh, of course people like Le Corbusier painted all the mor in morning, he just came into the office in the afternoon. His great friends were people like Leger, and Laurence and so on. Uh, Le, uh, and, and, uh, uh, of course, and so on. And they ha there's a dialogue going there. You know, one knew what the other one was doing. There's a silent, uh, immediate communication. So that the uh, painting became, uh, for Le Corbusier, was almost like his own development for what he could do in architecture, you know? Uh, it's a very strange thing in a way, what came out of purism. He had all of these canvases, you know, his garage was just stocked with all these canvases, no one wanted to buy because he was an architect. He was an architect, you're not meant to be a painter. And so he was not known as a painter, and his, one of his great struggles and rather disappointments was he really wanted to be known as a painter. Every now and again he had his exhibitions, everyone came back to him as an architect. You're an architect, you mustn't be a painter. But that is, uh, was the, the kind of barrier that he was trying to break down. I know that, uh, again, I was going to go back to the people I have some contact with because I consider they're very great people and they were great keys to 20th century development in architecture. Um, the same thing is actually true with Mies van der Rohe. Mies van der Rohe did not paint, but he was in very close contact with people like Kandinsky and Paul Klee and so on, and he collected their work. You know, he was a great admirer of theirs. If you went into Mies van der Rohe's uh, um, apartment in Chicago, you don't see any work of Mies van der Rohe anywhere. You don't even see his own furniture. All you see are Paul Klee's, Kandinsky's, Paul Klee's, Kandinsky's, you know? And um, that, 
to me is a very, you know, very, very healthy relationship. Wright didn't have that, by the way. He had no understanding whatsoever of either painting or of sculpture. It was actually atrocious whenever he came close to them. But I have felt myself that it's a, it's a very sad time, in a way, in which architecture has gone through a period in which it's a kind of second-rate art, you know? Uh, something to do with, um, uh, I don't know, getting a job completed on time or according to a budget or satisfying the building department or something like that. If you can't get above that, um, you know, that mundane level, you've got to do that to survive, of course. But if you can't get up above that level, you know, and treat it as a dialogue in the, in the world of art, you know, then, then uh, you call it real estate or something else, you know, you can do that. But if what I must really call architecture and, and respect is the same thing that a painter considers himself an artist. He, uh, the other painters, of course, you don't, you know, I, I mean, the you know, painter's union and so on. But if the real idea of the painter as an art <laughs> is that everything means something as a communication, and there's that dialogue. And I think that you should, had, should participate that, in that, not as a Sunday painter, not as a hobby, you know, but you give yourself to that. I think, I think that's, that's, that's a really important thing. Did I answer your question? Yes. With Tangi? No, I, I, I never met Tangi. It's somebody I admire, you know, enormously. It's very much at a distance. I, I never... Yes. Yes, it could, it could be uh, some, some common background back in there. I've never seen his work. I just admire him very much. Yes. Pardon? Where you at when you Solari? had just left, actually, right. Yeah, he was building this little, first little house in the desert, the little dome house, yeah. And, um, uh, yeah, I got to know him uh, a, a little, little bit, and uh, then, of course, he went back to Italy after that. Yes? Um, <coughs> I don't know, really. I suppose you could say um, I don't quite see it like that. Um, Corbusier motifs. Um, uh, Corbusier is my master, you know. I mean, everyone has some place in history they like to place themselves in. You know, you have a mother and a father, and you know, you have children and so on. And I fit in there somehow, you see. Uh, uh, and uh, so there is, he is in my background, you know, very much so. Yes, he had people in his background, very much so. And um, I suppose if you were to say you look more of my work, you'd say it is not Le Corbusier. Le Corbusier never used the triangle ever, for example, you see, as, 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 a, as a basis for his work. He never used that. The student union is all triangles. I just kind of give this because it's not entirely that. There are basic elements there, certainly, the opening up of space, the lessons that I've learned there. And I feel that in a way that uh, I like to consider myself not as an isolated phenomenon, but as part of a stream, as a part of a stream of the culture, part of a stream of nature, um, in which uh, the same way in which um, so the buildings of the Renaissance were built and the cathedrals were built and so on, they're modeled on previous buildings, you know. And uh, only say that now I have my own feedback. This is one thing I was trying to show here. I think because I have had time, I'm, I'm getting on in years, I have enough feedback now, you know, so that I can work from my own experience rather than having to work on buildings that other people have built. Um, yeah, Le Corbusier certainly was the greatest impression that I ever had, a great relationship that I ever had with any, any other architect. And uh, so I suppose, you know, that is, a, that is a natural one. There are certain principles. I rather think of the word principle rather than, than motif. Um, uh, how to use rain or light, I suppose, or, or concrete, things like that. Um, I experienced certain things in, the, in his office and a uh, formulative period in my life. Yes? Since he was deemed on the material of architecture, um, I noticed he used concrete a lot. How do you see those two materials interacting? Well, I was trying to show how they were reacting on the screen, you know. I mean, it's easier for me to read to show those things. Um, uh, I thought, in a way, I can't quite, uh, how can I explain some of these things? Um, 
architecture, I suppose, through the main, you know, thousands of years, has been uh, so basically stone, I think. That has been the basic material, really. There are some cultures, like Japanese, who have used wood quite a bit, and certainly there are peasant structures in many parts of the world. But I think the main development of the main culture of architecture is stone uh, for, for hundreds of years. And uh, I was certainly brought up, my, my home is in, was in England, and as a child I lived in a house built entirely of stone. It was built about 600 years ago, you know. And I related to that you know, very, very, very happily as a, as a child. And the, um, I think that uh, c concrete has the advantages, obviously, over, over stone in the fact that one can re reinforce it, pre-stress it, and one can do you know, this tremendous amount of things. Um, I don't know, I think if the question is, you know, like human flesh is soft and s concrete is more durable or something like that, I suppose that is one thing. Uh, concrete would last over years. Uh, I think there are concrete structures that are several uh, hundreds of years old, uh, so that um, we are all more transitory, perhaps, you know, than, than, uh, than a lot of architecture. Um, I mean, how many people are, you know, how many generations do you go back before you see the, um, uh, before the architects of the pyramids in Egypt? You know, a lot of flesh has turned to dust, you know, meanwhile. And I don't, I, and the Egyptians may have had an over-obsession of eternity or something like that. That's not thing so important. But that I think architecture as the sea is a long-lived, long a long-lived thing, and I perceive it as that. Um, uh, of course, flexibility within it. And it seems that concrete really does that. It allows the very long spans, of course, one, if one wants to use that, you know, and the durability, the fact it just doesn't rust away or rot. Yes? Yes, I think that probably today that is, is, is quite a problem for people, uh, apparently. Um, but it is, how can I explain it? Um, uh, there is a certain stream, you see, that does exist. And I don't know if you know, if you've really looked into history, you know, at all, but you do find very much that a student learns from his master, you know, and he consequently makes some kind of a base out of his, his basic education, you know, and moves on. Uh, of, of course, uh, but that the idea, I think, that one should do something, you know, like absolutely new every Monday morning or something like that, is not consistent to me with the general stream of development. Um, if you look at, uh, I suppose, um, uh, many of the, of the really great buildings of the world, you find they have a precedent. There's always a precedent, and that precedent is by somebody else, and that experience has been has been passed on. And there is, within that, not only the technical experience, but I'd say there is a kind of an, an emotional base that one, one uses. Um, I, uh, because of the, the two or three questions seem to be very similar in that, in that vein there, um, I'd like to give, take a, a kind of, a, say, break from the slides. I just did this to kind of get started a little bit. and. Um, not, I'm not completely able to equate my own philosophy with the, of the universe, so to speak, with the work that I'm doing. What I've shown now has been feedback, and I think that point should have got across. Um, but I do feel that one should look um, on the, at the large scale of things. And uh, a lot of us have not had the, perhaps the privilege of living in a different epochs. You know, I, I must say I have. I've been able to live you know, in the 17th century and live in the 18th century and so on in different in, in environments pretty much intact in, in different parts of Europe. And, and um, uh, uh, have been able to have, I uh, could say, this depth, which is rather different. I know you have to be driving around in, in Santa Monica. But if you have, uh, this perspective, you know, that history is not necessarily what is torn down last week and what is put up next week, but which has got a far stronger, longer, larger scale uh, to it, 
um, I think it's worth doing. Uh, otherwise, you get in a strange situation, you know, the high heels or low heels or whatever it is. It, the, the, what takes place in the fashioning clothes, maybe one can do that very, very well, but architecture things last longer and, and I feel myself very much happier in relating to the world and relating to the cosmos on a larger scale. Um, uh, that the fluctuations of this week and next week, but that there is a stream, and there's a c large continuous stream, which one is part, inasmuch as one is part of nature. Um, that uh, the universe, uh, I mean, a, we have a very local scene, and we focus always on this very local scene, uh, uh, our immediate time, our immediate place. Um, if one can pull away from that, you know, if one can take the earth, so to speak, and, and put it away a little bit. Um, you can see the relationship, you know, how large is the earth, how tiny is the speck of earth in relationship to the sun, for example, you know, or, or relationship to its own orbit around the sun. Pull back, you know, again, and have a look at that outer space and some awe, the kind of awe that when you go out at night and you look up at the stars, you know, you get an idea of perspective. There's, a, there's, a, there's an orb, there's an incredible kind of beauty. But as far as I'm concerned, that is the real perspective. And I like that dialogue. I treasure it very, very much. That uh, one can realize how small and how momentarily you know, one is in some overall much larger development that's taking place. And that the human being will have a far greater role in this general evolutionary development but that the evolutionary pattern is there and is independent, I think it's independent of whether, I uh, say, one art critic is coming to the fore and the other's receding or whatever it is. Um, the continuity is the great thing in the, in, in the universe. And um, I uh, was very impressed when you know, I learned that the 99.9% uh, .9 or something like that, someone could correct me, of the universe consists of the hydrogen atom, which is the simplest element. I mean, it's the si simplest atomic form. And uh, it's 99.9% like .9 of the universe consi consists of that. That those, that the hydrogen atoms, in incredibly far apart from each other, draw together, that they, that they come together uh, over these tremendous epochs of time. Some uh, kind of time which it's very difficult for us to, to measure that that is part of the evolutionary process, that the evolutionary process applies to the evolution of molecules, or the evolution of other at atoms from a very, very basic elements to the evolution of molecules, you know, and the evolution of molecules to more complex form, you know, moving forward, uh, but being very similar, only slight variations on the previous, previous form and over long, long periods of time. And that is, it goes on through the d development of the amino acid on into the cell uh, and the uh, single cell uh, beings and for, for s s incredibly long periods on the, on the earth as being only one speck of dust, you know, in, 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 in a cosmos in which the same thing is happening in different levels of development before or after, or enormous spaces apart, and I, I, I just see, uh, you know, my, oneself as part of that. Um, that slow evolution, you know, which reaches the point of um, uh, man, you know, very brief arrival on, on, on the earth, you know, and um, uh, in uh, what man's particular role then becomes, and, and anyone who is charged with certain creative responsibilities, um, I, th I feel has got very, he has obviously the unknown of the future, he's in charge a little bit of the unknown of the future, but he must, he should draw upon this past, um, not as uh, an enemy, not as something that holds him back at all, but as a, an incredible source of strength, as a supportive thing. And uh, I see human being as an extension of that and civilization, in a way, uh, as, as following that. Yes? What dynamics is building into the structure then? You say it's going to be here for long periods of time. How do you oh. allow for the change to take place and then the interior? 
Oh, I see. Well, I thought I had explained that maybe on some of these slides, you know, I showed just a frame of people doing their thing inside it, you know, something like that. Um, uh, you can do that, you see, you can have a, you can build a city like Rome, you know, and then and have a whole civilization and you build another Rome on top of it and that has a whole layer of civilization and you do it again, you know. You see, you see um, uh, Fellini's Roma, you know, and you can see what goes on top of that and gone. It's all possible, this is absolutely possible to build with things that last a long time so there's a dialogue from one civilization onto another. You don't have to clean it every day and, and, and start again from scratch. You don't have to do that. You bring entirely new things. And that's, I think, rather the beauty, beauty of it is because the, uh, uh, the dialogue is there. If you, this is one of the opportunities you have as an architect, I think, is to dialogue not only with your contemporaries, you know? And uh, I think it should be respected very much. I, I, I get the message, you know, of what um, uh, uh, Bramante, what um, uh, Michelangelo, or what um, uh, Eiffel, you know, was doing. Uh, I have their message, you know, and I can see it, you know, and uh, if I walk into uh, uh, Chartres Cathedral, you know, or for, for that matter, if I walk into an early prairie house of right, I have the message. It really em embraces me, you know, I've received it. You know, thank God it wasn't torn down. You know, I'm just very, very happy. I'm not a, con a person really advocating a tremendous amount of conservation, but I do appreciate, you know, there's a passage of time uh, that an art form can have that, and I think, I'm not saying that anything should be cast for uh, perpetuity. I think probably now you could make a film, you know, and, and, and that, would be, that would be great too. Maybe one should not try to save a city like Venice. All of these things are questions. I hold them as open questions. But while one has the opportunity of that dialogue, I think one should make you know, the most of it, if it's with King Tut or, King Tut or whatever, uh, whatever it is. There's a tremendous depth. And the great creative people, the people who really have inspired me enormously, of course, Le Corbusier is one in, in architecture, people like Picasso, uh, James Joyce in literature, they are the great revolutionary figures of the 20th century, and their dialogue with history is unending. They draw upon it unendingly, you know, absorb it, challenge it. Yes, yes, I, I, I'll take this question. Yes. I was bring things to human scale. I was wondering whether you use color in the same end. Um, you know, to bring instead of an entire concrete building being so sterile, you use color to bring yes. Yeah, well, this thing about being sterile, I, I'll, I'll stand up here on defense on this thing. Well, not that it's yeah, sterile, yeah, color can be sterile too, you know. It's how you use these things. I just, this is an interesting thing. It's a good question. I like it very much. I wish I could answer it adequately. Um, uh, color is an incredible thing. You know, it really is that um, why, yeah, something like steel arriving on the job without the prime coat, you know, it has incredible colors. And uh, one of the great delights, one of the, I can't always explain anything, but it does turn me on enormously, is when you strip the form from the concrete, you know, see what, <laughs> see, how, see what it was, you know, it's not what you, maybe even what you hoped for, you know. But it's so incredible what it, what, what it presents, you know. And, and it's, uh, you know, maybe a bit of a mess, you think, at first, you know, so it's not quite right, or you know, it's not what you expected. It has to dry out a little bit, so it's going to change, of course, but. The colors in concrete, raw concrete, I mean, uh, it hasn't been painted. To me, more incredible than one can ever paint concrete, you know. And the, it's not, you talk about color, color's not necessarily, it comes out of the canvas and be perceived with your eyes. And that's the great thing about the painters, the great painters, not only the impressionists, uh, the great painters is what the same painter sees in his eyes, looking at a wall, you know. And uh, I must say that I, I do see in raw steel, raw wood, all these things without before the paints applied to it, incredible colors, and I love those, and I love the patina, and I love the aging, you know, of those things. I, I, I say I, I lived in a house in which things are just aged and aged and aged, and I just, I just love it. You know, I like it when it's new too. You know, all of those things. Uh, the introduction of color uh, is an interesting thing. What happens if you take? A concrete column, at least in my world, if you take a concrete column, the unpainted concrete column has an incredible strength to it, which is a very important part. 
of architecture, is that strength or that structural member. If you paint it, you paint it white or yellow, bright color, anything, or pink, you know, that strength goes. You know, it's an emotional, emotional fact as far as I'm concerned, you know. And uh, even if you paint it to kind of look like concrete color, you know, it's gone. You're lost. You never get it back. You don't get that back again. It's that strength that is in that unpainted material, extremely important to me. The color is in a world of abstraction. It's an interesting thing. You put paint on something, you may not know exactly what you painted, put the paint on. You may not know that underneath the paint is uh, concrete or plywood or, or urethane. And I would say that that abstraction, in a way, gives it a kind of weightlessness. It moves it into another world. And so it's a simple architectural language. And uh, of course, it's an another lesson I learned very much from Le Corbusier, is that to make a screen, you know, not load-bearing screen to make that light, you paint it. You see, you, make the, you can paint that, and then you've taken that, that strength away from it. And then you give the strength to the structural members. I mean, architecturally. Yes? Given the fact that the history of this is only the San Francisco State University, I'd like you to comment a little bit on the cultural context and how times have changed and how the durability changed with them. By that, I have to explain myself a little bit. As I understand it, this campus went through a tremendous amount of tumult at the time that they were trying to choose an architect. I believe Safi and some other people were also in the running. Uh, various buildings were proposed. And obviously, the building that was built, I think many people would say, is a, a rather revolutionary statement and consequently symbolic of the times. You have those thrusting forms in the sky. It's a very active building. It looks like the type of building where you would have political meetings and rallies. But what happens to a building like that when all the revolutionaries have graduated or, or dropped out, and the people today are more concerned with getting into law school and going to the political realm? And I'm curious to know if you feel that your building still keeps up with the times for the, the, the type of campus that exists today. Can a person read a book in that building and feel comfortable rather than listen to rock music? You know, a student union has to change and adapt to many different generations. Is your building really up to that test? Well, I uh, see, you know, it's a really good question. I really like that. Um, there's two or three aspects to it. One is the political one, which you began with, I think, maybe. And the other one is the change, whether something will survive, you know, whether it will go on being, um, being, being valuable. Um, uh, you bring me at the moment to a level, I mean, the, the discussion uh, on a slightly different plane to the one I wanted to go on, to move on to, but I'm very happy to take it at that, at that level. Um, and uh, I think that is the level that um, uh, concerns most people, uh, whether something will function adequately um, uh, after a number of years and so on. Uh, um, the history of the building is that, uh, is exactly right, the students were very turned on students, you know, they really were, and they had, uh, there's a big wave coming up you know, it was the uh, flower children were there and so on. And uh, it was a very important time in history. In fact, I wonder whether there will be such an important time again of that kind. You know, maybe there won't be. But it was an important time. And they, uh, it was a challenge, you see. Uh, everything up to that time on that campus had been designed by the, um, the, the architectural and engineering um, the OAC, o Office of Architecture and construction or something like that in Sacramento. All buildings were designed in, the, in this very bureaucratic world in which there was, no, there was no very human relationship. This was the first building on campus to be designed by an individual architect. And uh, they were conscious of this, and they, they, the, the students sent out for everybody. They invited Soleri and Safdi, of course, and ev almost everybody showed up on campus. Uh, met the students. It was a very interesting, stimulating time. I was one of them. Um, the contract wasn't given to me, it was given to Moshe Safdi. And, uh, and he worked with the students there during the time of the strike. And uh, the building became, unfortunately, the building that he designed, which I would love to have seen built, was, 
uh, political football in between the students and the chancellor's office and everyone's more interested in the political world than in the art world. You have to question, you know, what is the most important? Make that up, you know, decide that in your own mind. Most people today are interested, I know that, in the, in the political world. But the pol politics was, was absolutely sort of fantastic then. The, there was there were a ring of police around the place. There, there was uh, the, uh, the general strikes everywhere. Faculty were striking everywhere. There was a confrontation of the establishment. And uh, uh, Masi Safdi, I think he was actually torn to shreds in the whole thing. And he was put into some impossible situations. He would be able to explain that much better than I can. I'm sure he'd rather like to. Um, the, he was not able to bridge the gap between the powers that would actually make a building possible and the aspirations, dynamic demands, uh, new consciousness, which was going on among students, you know. And uh, so they went back again, they canceled his contract, and uh, a new one w was set up, and the same group of people all brought back in again, I was one of them. And uh, they decided that uh, for some reason I could bridge that gap. So this became my job. I had two clients, you could say like two worlds, you know. So I, I did many, many things. I took a, had a class, I directed a class on campus. We had a class on designing the building. A lot of the ideas of this design, there, the levels of consciousness, the pyramids themselves, the general direction of that building was designed in a room, you know, very much like this with people generally, not in my drafting board, you know. And I would try and give that form in my language, of course. I interpret that as, as a program. There's no other source. So. Uh, the question was, of course, uh, um, what kind of a client uh, did I have? Uh, and I can only think of humanity, you know, as being that client, because uh, by the time the building is built, you see, the people who participated in the thoughts are somewhere else, you know? So new people are going to come. And I think one of the, well, one of the earliest uh, uh, discussions which was recorded that I made on designing the building was that it has to be designed for a client that's not yet born, you know? So that you have no dialogue, of course. And uh, it's really unimportant, it's less important, the people who are, are, are leaving, who had the thoughts, you know? But to capture that moment, you know, it was, it was important. Uh, the other one is uh, judging it in terms of today, well, there's only one way, really, and that is to talk to the people, you know, directly themselves. I make my observations. As I say, I've shown you some slides here, how people use something, and, and, I, and I hope that's, that's done fairly. fairly. The uh, principle of design that I nearly always have is that the structure is really a, a relatively free thing, you know, and in that you can make, you know, you can make a great number of changes. You really can. You can relate to it and so on. But if you don't have an anchor, so if everything is to be, if as a right here, but almost everywhere, you know, the 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 kind of turn on scene really is when you are confronted with. Um, something that is very definite, you know, and you've got something, I guess, to re resist or work against. But I say, just purely technically, there's a basic frame. And within that frame, there can be different programs. Yes? Um, yes, yeah. Um, uh, now again, I must sort of go back a little bit that um, I see colors two things. One is the uh, applied color and the other one is the, the inherent color. And um, one's observations, one's own observations in the landscape and of uh, the things that people wear. Uh, um, I think that uh, color is a very um, 
difficult and sometimes, you know, it's a very, very dangerous thing. Um, a painting, as when one is working as a painter with painting, uh, you can do entirely different things than what you can do with bringing in into space in architecture. I think I s said already the fact that um, a lot of the weight is taken away, the weight and strength is taken away when one paints. I think uh, steel and I think concrete, and the same I think is true with wood, that that is a subtraction from the, from the weight of something. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, I feel that it is extremely important uh, to draw attention uh, to certain things. Um, I say it's a, some kind of a symbolic role, uh, that an element, you know, a various element you expect to have a certain color. It's going through the, you can r identify uh, the structure, let's say, you know, is, is blue and the uh, mechanical system is orange. I'll show some slides, you know, to show how, how that goes. You color code in a, um, a boiler room, the various elements, so there is a, a language going with it. Um, I don't think I'm so good at expressing myself in words and answering this, you know, than I would be in showing how I would do it in a building. Um, I'm extremely interested in the observation of color rather than in the specification of color. I think I could say that. I just want to say two things regarding color. Uh, one of them is when I was in uh, Le Corbusier's office, it was a turning point. Everything he had done up to that time was to be abstract and to be weightless. That is to say, all the concrete was plastered smooth. It was painted white or painted of various colors, the polychrome, and he made he made that, and everyone expected the building that I was working on at that time to be the same. And his good students had gone to Brazil, and they were working in Brazil, and they were doing the same thing. They were painting, everything was white, you know. And that, that white was a, it was a very important thing for the clarity of form. And uh, when I was in Le Corbusier's office, he came back from the United States, and he come, came back from a trip in... Uh, at uh, Tennessee Valley, he was very, very impressed by Tennessee Valley Authority work. The dams were built there. And he saw, it was that time that he really saw this, what the rough concrete would do. And he introduced that then. And we all started, um, you know, ch we're changing actually detailing and so on on, on the building we were working on. Um, uh, to bring this uh, new, dis newly discovered, I guess, um, kind of, earthy strength into a world which up to then had been the abstraction of uh, purism. Qu uh, questions? Oh, yes, please. Now, let's talk about Corbusier's uh, brought up another thing. Uh, uh, I've been led to believe and read and heard that he was uh, I'd like to, to uh, separate the building from the environment or create a, a uh, drop interface. Uh, of merging the two, and it seemed that your building, the slides that we've seen, uh, didn't intertwine the two. Is that another, are you following Corbusier's uh, idea there? Or? Mm, well, no, I don't, I don't want to be, uh, you know, like a you know, critic of Le Corbusier, but I, I understand what you're saying there. Uh, the, for, the clarity of the form was an extremely important part, you know, of him, and the very early principles he lays down, you know, that we make, we, we, this is a very important part in painting and in um, the appreciation then of the new airplanes that were being built and so on and the uh, automobile, uh, the form that it took, it took in those days. And he always said, uh, you know, the important thing is to be, that we can see clearly. And this was, this was the great thing, the great thing that he loved and had learned from in, in Greece. And uh, the clarity, setting out the clarity of the form, um, yeah, and I suppose I, I do treasure that quite a bit. Yes, I think that is, that is to me rather, rather an important thing. The, the merging or the losing of something, I think, is not where I'm, I'm at. Right now, I'm doing some underground housing, by the way, which is, I guess is, is, is doing what a lot of people are doing. But uh, um, I do like very, very much that one can stand up, place something, and, and see it completely as a truly presented form uh, if an orchestra is to play something, you know, 
I don't want to hear this, you know, hear it all kind of lost into uh, the general chatter of conversation. You know, I like to hear every part come out brilliantly and clearly. Yeah, I do feel that in architecture. Pardon? They're not being, they're, I don't think they're being used to their full capacity, you know, and I think, I hope they will be. Um, again, one has to, has to see, you know, how, how think one has to almost visit there every month because something different happens there. Um, I, I showed you outside, obviously, you know, people use that as a place to climb, like a mountain, you know, it is there. Um, I think somebody else would probably do the critical part a bit, bit better. I have uh, a great, great, I've seen, you know, tremendous assemblies of people and great celebrations and incredibly in innovative things happen on San Francisco uh, Art Institute roof there, incredible things, you know. And uh, I haven't yet seen those things happen on the campus at San Francisco State. They may have happened when I haven't, haven't been around, but I, but I hope they will happen. Okay, I'd like to show some more slides so that I'm, my, I'm not hung up entirely on these projects. And could I have the lights then down? I would talk about a bit about the practice of architecture. Please use me again as something you can shoot at or anything. But I have, uh, I do run a practice. Uh, we try to make a, a living, try to survive and so on. And I don't only do these things, you know, which are um, uh, uh, as a completely just the pure art of it, so to speak, at the client's expense. I, my great interest is in medicine. I, 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 a lot of my work, and particularly the work going on in Canada now, is to do with medicine, and I do very ordinary buildings, you could say, in which I'm most interested in medicine, which takes place on the inside. This is an example, and this is a, a French hospital in San Francisco. This is an earlier kind of work that I did. I was shown there's something of an evolutionary process so we don't get stuck in the Le Corbusier system. Of course, it's up on Pilati and there are certain things I learned from that and so on. But this is, I do this kind of work. I'm more, in this case, one is in totally involved with my, the kind of clients I have in medicine don't know anything about, you know, that I built San Francisco State. They don't know anything about that at all. They respect my knowledge in the area of medicine and I'm extremely interested in that. So I say, this is what I was doing I know, 10 years ago, something like that. And I make um, uh, just a change now. I say human element is a different thing now. These buildings are not covered with human beings. I want to be observing them or cut them out entirely. Uh, I built now much more with industrial materials. This is a building, a hospital in uh, British Columbia. It's just been completed. And um, well, I found out that there's a greater flexibility that I have. These are very large spaces. It's hard to realize that. Uh, there's a 20, what it looks like one story height there is 20 feet, 20 feet high, two stories. There's a mechanical level called the interstice and there's a surgical level. And, uh, but again, you know, asked about you know, the use of color and so on. The, the, the windows are very small because of energy restrictions. The white is space. So the white, the color there symbolizes space and the, the blue which is a corrugated industrial steel material really corresponds with the structure, which is a very really light fabricated structure, which was made in Japan and shipped to British Columbia. But there's no concrete, that's all steel. And uh, I suppose you could say that it's, uh, it is a complete reflection, each floor is different, but the, the structure inside is exactly the same. I have a structural span 64 feet by 48 feet inside, and it's totally flexible. You know, somebody asked, what's it going to be like in the future? Every floor here can be torn out completely. It is inter while surgery is going on, any change can take place because there's a separation between the soil level and the surgical level. You know, that, uh, the uh, corrugated material, there's a depth of a truss that's nine feet deep. The cantilevers that are coming off here, which are the 16-foot cantilevers, are uh, uh, interchangeable. You can take them off and you can stick them on any floor. All floors, because in a hospital it's like a city, almost nothing repeats. Every form of medicine takes place there. So the floor plans are all different, you know, and so that allows me to get the right floor plan, you know, what the nurses want on one floor, the doctors want on the other, or the you know, administrator needs on the other. They have it. They have it the way they want it. But it's developed with the systems. 
And uh, but the basic pattern, the basic language, you know, is 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 there. Um, I uh, well, when when it goes on, because it keeps on changing, it will be added on. The system is going is going going to be growing. Um, it, it's a, it's a really very large building, um, and in the landscape, there it is. That's in a natural human landscape. And uh, there's something identifiable, you know, you can see the language. That's where the answer to the question of color, I suppose. There's a, there's a material here which just can't let, let just ru rust away, so it, it, uh, it is painted as, uh, and because uh, the orange is the mechanical system, blue is structural, white, you know, it's so very simple. White is also something of the freshness of a hospital, so I, I, I kind of like to see that. Now, I come now back to another area, and that is this question, uh, you know, is everything exactly the way uh, Le Corbusier did it and so on? It's, no, it's not. Of course, it's not. The principles are understood, you know, and then they slowly evolve in their own way. So this, the, and the matter of a dialogue, can you have a dialogue of architect? Can you talk seriously to a sculptor? Well, here's a case in which a sculptor is a client. And it happens to be very, very well known. A sculptor now has a great success uh, throughout the world. And he has an enormous shop. Uh, it builds great steel structures. And so we use his shop for building this building. But we start. This is the client's program. So I work together with a sculptor. So that's my program, you know. I don't care about having a bedroom, you know. If people bring their sleeping bags, that's fine, you know. I, I lived in New York, you know, in a, in a loft, and that's where I did my best work, you know, and there's no partitions, you know, the toilet's in the middle of the space, and so on. So the program there is basically, we have two generators, and we have tension between these two generators, and that tension is, is in the form of a, of a kind of hyperbolic paraboloid. We build with steel elements. I could develop a what is the program exactly the way you, you learn it in school, you know. It's uh, a space, you know, which lives for five years and then donates to the state of California. And it becomes a place where you can see his work in the landscape and so on. And so working with him, you know, developing the basic rules, you could say, of the, of the hyperbolic paraboloid. This is the kind of thing you could do very, very well in the school. I mean, you know, it's a student's job in a way. And has, because uh, uh, it evolves in different ways, and this is a, l a much later and fuller version. The still hyperbolic paraboloid is basically a square building with uh, the two basic generators, we call two basic generators, inclined, inclined surfaces, and um, it li a little bit, um, I say, with a, using attention uh, members over deep uh, steel, these are steel plate uh, girders, um, fabricated in the sculptor's yard and uh, brought onto the side with pivot connections. Little wheels will run across the top. We have cables drawn across. And this is not enclosed. Part of it will be enclosed. It may be a year not enclosed because of just the joy of seeing the structure a little bit longer than the usual short-lived building under construction. Then the roof and then the side walls and it'll be, I think eventually it will be an enclosed building. But, pardon? Uh, Marc de Souvereau. And um, to, so I just, just show you this in terms of the, uh, uh, how to say, having, having a dialogue you know, on, on that level with a client in which the program is not the type of thing that is uh, written, written down in terms of square foot areas, but in a, a concept of, of a structure. And this is the uh, latest edition. Uh, and that comes out of a program, I think, a bit, because uh, in studying the basic building, uh, it's decided that there should be a large space. The basic building was designed at a, 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 um, in the theater in um, San Francisco, a performance of ACT during intermission, 10-minute intermission, in which uh, we could go up to the side of the stage and watch how the stagehands rolled everything away, you know. So that's the basic plan, that anything could be rolled away inside, including staircases and everything else. You know, asked about flexibility, of course. There's nothing inside that space that can't be moved. But after that, 
deciding, well, maybe there should be a space which is fixed and which is not just that flexible. And uh, resulting from that are these uh, three cylinders, which have, one of them is a space in which you can sleep, another one just to uh, think, another one to bathe. Oh, this is something uh, you ask, you know, about this relationship to landscape. This is some, this is right up to date, this is as of last night. Uh, uh, this is some underground housing surfacing on, uh, in San Francisco. And um, uh, I'm doing my first underground housing. And the reason there is uh, that um, there's an open hilltop. And the uh, people in the community are kind of in love with the hill, this hilltop and want to acquire it, uh, would spend a lot of their money doing so. It's a very costly thing. And we found out that we could preserve the hill by building underground. And of course, there are spectacular views from that, that particular point. Uh, and this has all, it'll have all the things, bead wall and all the, all the you know, in things. And um, uh, solar and all that sort of thing. And put it be underground. And uh, the, one of the things that interested me very much is that the planners, um, don't really know how to tackle underground buildings. They ask for a rear yard, for example. Mm. <laughs> um, this is what I'm more interested in. And this is uh, uh, a study model which uh, uh, is in an area in which I'm moving. And that is to see how we could overcome this uh, incredible... Um, so unresolved conflict that goes on versus the high rise, you know. I love the high rise myself. I think it's just a, just a beautiful thing. It's just the people who waste their opportunities on it. And uh, uh, if you have, say, and how, how nice a street is. Well, a lovely thing a street is, which I absolutely agree. I've been promoting that. And rooftop spaces. Everybody should have access to rooftop spaces, and they should be streets and, and so on. That one could do that by in a way, building streets. You see, these are streets. These, are, these things are streets. You build these streets on top of each other, you see? This is, this is, this is a street here, Go, going straight back to, um, to a vertical core. And in the core, you have all the high-speed things, the elevators, just as, like the core of a, any high-rise building, stripped down. Uh, the uh, soil lines run in there, and the far lines, and the, uh, the elevators, and so on. Uh, but it's based on the idea, really, that everybody should have a terrace, an outdoor space, the life of a street, and uh, you can go up quite high doing this kind of thing. Um, this is uh, like a two, two, I think it's 200-story structure, you see? And you combine both. Why not? And the principle of this I'm very interested in, as someone would say, it is a steal from ancient history. This is how the spiral stairs were built. Spiral stairs were built in the uh, you know, very ancient castles in Europe. They prefabricated one element only, the step. They prefabricated that in stone uh, yeah, hundreds of years ago. Pre one prefabricated element, that's all you needed to build a spiral staircase. And I thought, how fantastic. If you could build a city out of one, basically one prefabricated element, that's what this, this amounts to. And instead of just having you know, uh, these high-rise things sticking up there, that you could walk actually in the outer edge, you know, from one level to another, you could walk, you have a perfect fire exit and all those things the building department want. But you don't have to have this centralized mechanical system. Everyone can open their windows, you know, to fresh air. But uh, a little bit more than that, that by having, say, not one, but you have two, they can uh, support each other, of course, quite well. But uh, a bit more than that, you know, I'm not, the, 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 as I've always said, the mechanical and structural elements are extremely important. You've got to get that behind you, but move on. And why should not, you know, two structures dance together? You know, this seemed to me something really important, that instead of these stiff things sticking up with different designs on the bottom and different patterns in the glass, you know, why can't the basic structure itself be one that really that the dances in space, the turns. So I like this very, very much in architecture that you design a building, and as you saw in some of the previous photographs, that as you go around it, it slowly changes, and you can't quite make it out, but it's really a very simple pattern. One prefabricated 
element, basically. So I uh, leave this, you know, as something which I know maybe Le Corbusier didn't do, you know, but based, <laughs> in a way, on having had, you know, the exposure to a great man who can think in, uh, in great ways, you know, on a great scale. And um, someday I'll uh, get it built, that's all. The Dempster, as you know, he's currently in practice with John Mutlow. Uh, he teaches at USC. I was glad to read in this morning's paper that there was a comment towards uh, social issues and kind of quote substantive issues and all that kind of stuff because from the beginning of this series I've been taking a lot of heat from apparently what people think are relatively esoteric kind of notions and I hopefully that Frank will discuss these things, and uh, as well as a lot of the people that are following him. Um, a lot of you might know him for his for his participation. I guess his, his um, he was the director of design at, at Prayer for the John Mansville competition. And I think some of the, the work we'll we'll see tonight is gonna is gonna deal in, in a, a wide range of issues that hopefully will will kind of clarify some of the questions up to now. Frank? I could put this around my neck. Well, I would like to thank you all for coming tonight too. I was I had uh, the absolute and distinct uh, suspicion that I was set up <laughs> because <laughs> I'm teaching at USC, but uh, so I'll forgive you all. And we have gone through uh, a band over at uh, a restaurant, and I hope that uh, I can, if not offer any tricks, perhaps some treats. Now, uh, some of the uh, clarification that I'd like to have a chance about uh, John Dreyfus's article I won't get into because I told it's not in good taste, and he's not here. So uh, I would like to, if I may, uh, explain first some of the things that at least currently interest me or trouble me, and I hope it coincides with your interest. And uh, after that, I would like to show uh, some of the work that I've been doing over the last uh, oh, three or four years. And. Uh, Tonight, I, I decided to start, after considerable agony, uh, to offer a series of observations, uh, not manifestos or anything serious like that, but uh, these things which uh, I'm thinking about now, and I hope that you uh, will have, after that, a clearer understanding than from the article how I perceive my role in this profession and uh, why I'm teaching, uh, in teaching in general, and I think most of us on this 10 or 11 uh, uh, group uh, is involved in teaching for one reason or the other, uh, maintenance of one's uh, habits or fighting ignorance. Uh, and I decided since uh, it is almost 100 years that uh, we started architecture schools, I think it was started in 1860 or 1870, I think the first one was at MIT, it may be a, a good time to have some uh, retrospective, at least, to look at the system. And in doing so, I decided to examine uh, 
what kind of uh, effect structured education had on my present behavior and present value system and present uh, activity in, in uh, the work that I do. I came to the conclusion, which is perhaps unsettling for a lot of us, that the structured portion of education that I experienced in uh, three different countries uh, had very little effect. And uh, most of the influences that I feel now is dominated or are dominated by individuals, by places, and by events, not by test scores, by grade point averages, or anything that we measure performance with. Because of that, I, I tried to, and I selected some uh, images and uh, examples of work as introductions of buildings and projects which uh, I think managed to narrow the gap from intentions to results, and which managed to demonstrate a harmony between, uh, let's say, environment, nature, and man-made edifices which uh, I would like to uh, be able to do, of course, too. I think uh, this exposure and influence in individuals and buildings is very important to me. I think it creates uh, some, uh, let's say, optimism. I think uh, it sometimes creates challenge and makes uh, us work or me work harder. <coughs> And I've decided also that uh, I am weak enough that I need heroes, even if they're not dead. So uh, with that, I would like to show the first group of slides, if I can. And uh, I don't know how to do this, but I'm sure it works more or less. It should be two. Now these, uh, I purposely crossed over in scale and in place. And I think uh, there is a very important uh, relationship between the individual project and urban design or the public realm, which uh, is perhaps neglected, or certainly I'm interested in. In, in, in both cases, there was, uh, I see it is uh, Halloween. In, in, in both cases, I feel there is a, a noticeable degree of optimism, exuberance, and uh, perhaps confidence that uh, I think uh, is a result of our admiration for a long time of these projects, and I think perhaps should be uh, more accepted today. As you see on your left, there is a very uh, distinct juncture between uh, old and new, between certainly technical attitudes and perhaps more traditional ones. On the right, you see a very clear uh, demonstration of, I think, the organizational, social, and political value system, and uh, a very, I think, comfortable coexistence with uh, the natural surroundings. At the same time, I feel that you have uh, attention to all of these things which have to do with actual arrangements, which have to do with uh, uh, symbolism and metaphors and the like. On the one side, you have excess and uh, perhaps exploitation demonstrated on the other. You have attention to detail. You have a, a, a craftsmanship which uh, is a result of uh, tradition, pride, and uh, I think social security, not in the present sense. You have an acceptance of technology, and you have an, uh, an uh, uh, tolerance for history. And I think if, uh, if we could manage that since uh, we plan for the future, and the future, I think, in my definition, is nothing but uh, projected history tempered by the present, this was accomplished here. You have on the left side uh, a building which is very important to me, uh, in addition to, to a Baroque uh, house which was done in a then contemporary fashion without apologies. You have a celebration and exuberance of mass housing 
on the right side, which I think uh, excels past the 2% arc that uh, is institutionalized in the post-World War II period. I mean, you have a dominance of nature and a coexistence of, of nature, and you have a coexistence of all the arts, which I think sometimes we forget now, and perhaps uh, rather arrogantly, some of us architects assume, uh, as you see on the left. You have a very advanced uh, example of the shingle style, without wood shingles on your left. You have uh, a demonstration of two multiple housing projects on the right, where the uh, facades were treated differently and uh, from different people and at different times. You have, uh, again on the left, a very modern building by a 19th century man who had uh, the ability to be accepted by those in power and at the same time had the ability to coalesce and, uh, if you like, work together with all of the trades, including painters, sculptors, and, uh, of course, cra uh, craftsmen, you have, I think, a very consistent and therefore convincing attitude where in a building art has its role, where decoration has its role, and where the balance between functions and, uh, let's say, uh, aesthetic consideration is met. I think you can see that in the drawings uh, on, your li on your right, as well as in the built multiple housing project here on, on, on the right. These are some details of the previous uh, project. On the left, I, to me, is a, a very good example of a period in time where you have a, a, an energy demonstration and a confidence in the people that planned and built this project. And I think a very well-fitting uh, existence with a natural surrounding, which perhaps uh, we are too timid uh, to tackle now. The picture on the right here is a, uh, an example of Otto Wagner's entrance too, and you see that he used color for different patterns for different reasons than just to excel in uh, prism colors. I'd like to say now, at this point, before we talk about some of the work that I have attempted, a little bit about us as a profession, and I hope I can uh, uh, be a bit optimistic about it. Uh, I like to, because of the teaching involvement that all of us have, I think we have an extraordinary responsibility. I think uh, equally that our profession is a very unique one. I think uh, our profession has a very difficult dichotomy in its values. I think often our strengths are our weaknesses. I think our adversaries are often our clients. I think we often have the best interests in mind of the majority of people, but no one asks us to or elects us. I think we often claim to worry about the poor, but always work for the powerful and the wealthy. I think we're often concerned about the past, but, provide, but try to provide a better future. We have to be playful, they say, or Eric Hoffer said, to be creative. Yet, we have to be sincere to get the trust of the establishment. We have a very extensive education, six years or more often, and come away with very uh, limited, if any, quantifiable abilities or skills. The most desirable normally is that which is called talent, which normally you bring into school. I think all of these uh, contradictions or apparent contradictions have to find a place within us to coexist, and we have to try to deal with them in a positive way. And I, for one, I know it's very difficult to do so. But I think it is at a point now where everybody else and all other professions are so specialized that they uh, have a great difficulty to adjust to different uh, value systems and different conditions. This, I believe, is our strength. Our generalized education, I think, is now or certainly will be shortly our advantage. I think we have to realize that we often work for more than one client. I think we all often work at least for three or four of those that give us uh, the job or pay us. I think we often work for ourselves. 
I think we have to work for the users of the building that may be generations of users, not just the, con the, the, uh, the present ones. And I think we have to work for history. And I think often, depending on convenience, we choose to work in a variety of combinations and emphasize whatever is convenient to us at that time. I think at the same time, we have to acknowledge the fact that there is a difference, as in music, between the written piece and the played music. I think this exists in architecture. I think the gap between the intentions and the fact is often perhaps great, but always exists. I think the theoretical and practical aspect of architecture have to be maintained and can't be closed without stagnation. I think at the same time, it should not prevent us from working. I think our ability to maintain integrity in this very uh, difficult period and difficult uh, uh, way that we found ourselves, we have to strengthen. We have to contribute, I think, therefore, on several levels. We have to deal with issues that are affecting many and not just the few. I am interested in the aesthetics that results of it and the organizational problems which are part of the definition of that. And I like to think in any event that I uh, respond to this concern of mine. I do believe what I manage or what I'm attempting to do is to incorporate new layers of concern as I work. And there's no substitute for working because I think you can't do everything at once or wait till the right opportunity and ability overlaps. I think it is an additive process, in my opinion, and not an exclusive one. I am, for one, trying to become inclusive in my work and not exclusive. And I think it is uh, that which uh, gave me the title or the label of uh, being a having a social conscience. If this is so, I feel rather flattered. Now, as, as most of us, this is out of, uh, as most of us do, when you start on your own, you have to go through a variety of bathroom remodels, kitchen remodels, and remodel jobs, and then sometimes one building and sometimes two, and if you're lucky, three or four. And that takes as many years, maybe four or five years if you're lucky. So have I. I had to go through that. And it's in, in, in retrospect, it's not a bad discipline. Because if you believe that you can do a little better, even if you have to design a chair, or if you have to lay out a kitchen, or if you have to re, uh, remodel a house, I think you should do it. It's like any other profession, or a doctor, for instance, who can't have the discretionary power to treat only those glamour cases that uh, come to him. In this case, which is one of two remodeled jobs that I did, the problem was the typical one, that the house was uh, added on over a period of time, was occupied by people that had different lifestyles, different uh, uh, room requirements. And the problem was what to do so that the result is A, responsive to uh, a total house and not an additive one, and B, they could live in in the process and C, wouldn't cost too much. So what we did is uh, we did this. We tore down half of the house, extended one wall of it, and put a new roof on it. And I know I'm simplifying because it took a long time and we had to go through a lot of heartaches with the building departments, but in essence, that was it. And uh, the result is this axonometric, which is a new house with a new roof, the existing portion here. And this is what it looks like on uh, looking down. And it's in Palos Verdes. At this point, I'd like to say I would prefer to go very fast. And I have, I have not shown any plans in these slides because I don't really want to lean on your patience. And I can assure you that, uh, you know, the structures work and the shear walls work and the toilets work and the plumbing walls are lined up. And uh, 
because I've been checked by various agencies for that. <laughs> so all I, I would like to discuss now is, uh, perhaps or later, to show what I consider a, a, at least a built or realized intention, and I, for one, and maybe you could share your opinions with me, can see a lot of uh, gaps between what I try to do and what we manage to do. Again, we try to uh, create, in this case, alternatives which allow the family to live in different ways, which uh, I find very important, so that individuality of the family members is preserved, flexibility of them is preserved, and the family can, can uh, respond to those occasions in the year uh, that it has to. This is the second uh, remodeling effort. The problem was very much the same. The solution was a little different, but conceptually the same. A two-story addition was put in a place where a carport was, and a new roof was added over both. And the reason for that is has to do with foundations and soil conditions and all of these uh, mundane things that nobody uh, really wants to talk about, but often they influence the physical result. In this case, what we try to do, because I am very interested in structural questions and I'm very interested in technological issues, but in none of these two remodeling cases was it possible to really excel and get domus type uh, quality out of it. And therefore, I, we de I decided that the best we could hope for is that we get a spatial quality which uh, unifies the project and also which didn't exist before in an additive way by adding rooms or by adding larger rooms and so on. And uh, some of this I, I would hope you can see here. The next one was a house which was done as a, as a total house, not as a remodel or addition. And it is built in Bell Canyon. It's a very difficult site overlooking in a, a desert environment, essentially, overlooking the San Fernando Valley on an 80-foot drop in this area in a very difficult access road up the hill from there. And uh, in this case, as I hope you will uh, see in subsequent examples, what I'm trying to do is I have essentially a modular or, or a, a pattern of uh, segments or portions of the house which are assembled in this way, in this case linear, in other cases staggered, or in a third one uh, connected with a freer shape. But what they do basically is that they house elements of uh, the living sequence. They house the kitchen and the dining area, or the family room in this case. They house the living room entry area, or dining room sitting area, bar entry area in this case, and the living room in the other. And in, the, in between, I try to create enough flexibility in terms of movable partitions and so on to allow the house to be used in a variety of ways. And I also try to do this in a circulation pattern so that you can use the house essentially as you would use a, a village. So that the house can be broken up for a particular occasion to be used by visitors, to be used by tenants or to be sublet or to be used by someone that is healthy, another one that is sick or that, uh, etc. All of these things which the family has to respond to, but which in my uh, opinion is very difficult to do in most of the conventional arrangements, conventional or most of the typical arrangements. The, the other, this is an, an axonometric showing the total volume of the house. This is the first or garage level. This is the second level down here, and this is the third. We have, again, a uh, two-story living space, and uh, the dominant view is in this direction. We have, of course, solar collectors for hot water. We have the arrangement of a swimming pool that is very energy uh, conscious by having the dark portion, which is the swimming channel or the exercise portion of the room, and the, uh, of, of the pool, and the light. Uh, colored area is uh, the shallow portion, which is uh, done in such a way that this water heats up and recirculates. The, the shape of the pool is uh, a combination of the contours as well as formalistic capriciousness. 
you, you have, as you can see here, you know, separate uh, circulation that uh, allows you to use the third or the master bedroom level from the garage directly or come in on this level, which is the more uh, public uh, main front door of the house. This, the second house, which is perhaps an easier example to explain what I tried to on the previous one, is also built. It's a two-story house. And it, I think I managed in this case to demonstrate a little clearer the, the realms or the domains of the various family groups or family members. This is the main entry. This is the uh, family, family's master bedroom, outside sitting area, work area, and uh, separate and in an egress from the garage. This is the main entrance in the house where you make the decision to go one or the other way. These, this is a, a space which we call guest room or family room, and this is a children's square here. The whole area here is connected with the more public areas of the house, which is the dining room, the kitchen, the study, and the living room. The house, of course, can be used in a variety of ways and can be expanded in this way, in the case of the dining room, by using this room in this way to use the deck in front of the living room and so on, so that you can uh, rearrange it according to the particular occasion. That's a model of that. The coloring here is, uh, I, I do or like to do that, and uh, what I do is I do different kinds of colors. One is to show the structure or the uh, load-bearing elements in the structure, and another color would be the flexible elements in it. And then the, the previous one, I try to show a gradation of color from yellows to blue, which, which uh, identifies the public and the private areas, or the transitional areas, as you go from public to private in a house. This is a model of the same house. Uh, I'm sure you see it. And in this house, uh, I did this, and this is a, the one that wasn't built. It was in a very narrow lot, like often I have a chance to do that nobody else wants to do because there are substandard lots or very difficult ways to do it. It was 60 feet by 120 feet. And what you see is essentially a 20 by 20 uh, square pavilions, two stories high, uh, that constitute the various pieces of the house. In this case, it's a garage and a studio above it. This center portion here is the entry area, the children's room above and kitchen and dining below. The living room area is here with uh, three different kinds of uh, ceiling heights. And uh, the bedrooms of children and parents is here. Because it was so, so tight, we decided to make a round swimming pool so that you couldn't see the end. And uh, you make believe that it's very large. These are drawings of that previous house to indicate some of the, in color, some of the functions and uh, the relationships of them. I don't know if you can see it or not, but it's, uh, you can see here is the entry. The above area, the, the second level, which is this level, is connected by terraces with their separate in and egress. So for example, if the children want to come home late, they would use that stair not the front door and the main stair, which is under here. <coughs> of course, the same thing hold, would hold true for the parents if they don't have the authority to use the front door. The, the, uh, the living area of the house is here and can be expanded in this direction, which is up there, for a more private outdoor area, which is surrounded by a wall, and in this direction for the more public areas in the living room which would be accessible from the kitchen and dining area to the pool and deck area, which is shown up there. Now, I'm, I'm a little out of sync here. But this is a, a project which I'm now doing, and uh, I'm still doing the same thing. It's a, it's a duplex in Venice, California. The only thing that I'm trying to experiment with here is uh, color in order to get a, a bigger uh, 
uh, spatial result, not only the two-story spaces. It's again a 30 by, I believe, 190 foot lot. It's very narrow. And these are models that show the individual floors. This is the upper level, and this is the lower level with the upper level in place. And uh, what, what we are trying to do here is to, by material and color, try to extend the in and outdoor spaces so that they become one, which is an advantage, of course, that we have here and uh, a lot of other places can enjoy. Now, to keep up the, the pace, I would like to now take a, a second or two to explain some work which I which we're doing now and I find rather interesting for, in addition to the regular reasons, for others. And this is work that we have two projects in the Bahamas, which is an island off Miami, uh, 20 minutes or so by Eastern Airlines, if you're lucky. And uh, the island is uh, one of, I think, 900 islands which constitute the Bahamas. They became independent in 1972 from English uh, tutorship. They're part of the Commonwealth, uh, but they're not politically part of uh, the Commonwealth of England. So they have uh, a very uh, pronounced pride in wanting to do everything themselves. <coughs> it's very difficult to work there, and uh, they have to, however, import everything from Florida, uh, wood, all kinds of building materials. There is no uh, infrastructure provision other than electricity, telephone, and roads. But the roads have no uh, <coughs> water system, sewage system, or anything like that. The water is usually done by wells. The waste disposal is done by either wells or cesspools or sewage treatment plants, depending on the size of the project. This is the location of one of the two projects. It's a single family house which will go on here. You can see the site clearance and so on. This is the beach, and this will be a future one or two houses on the neighboring lot. This is, uh, to give you an idea of the climate, it is very humid, very hot, and uh, similar, I suppose, to uh, Florida. This is the view from the lot. This is the uh, foundation of a wall that is going in, and this is the public access to the beach, and this is an existing multi-family uh, apartment unit to one side of it, to the right side as you look at it. This is the beach again. This is the public and the private as they come together there. And this is the model of the, of the house that we've designed and started construction on. Again, just as a brief and quick explanation, you, we have uh, our automobile access here, foot access here or through here, and we have basically three families living in this house, sometimes at the same time, often not, usually at the same time during holidays such as Christmas or whatever brings families together. Uh, all the rest of the times, I'm sure they try to maintain their privacy. So we have... Uh, one group living here with a work area, bathroom, study area, and separate uh, in an egress to the beach. We have uh, the second family, a child here, a deck outside, and a bathroom and so on, and a bedroom for the parents here, and a deck out here, and separate in an egress here. This is the pool. And we have the third or the master bedroom bathroom under here. And all of it is tied together by a uh, living room, kitchen, dining room, and the normal necessities that bring people together. In this case, we have, similar to the next project, we have a very uh, overlapping definition of what is public and what is private, what is front and what is rear of the house. Legally, the front of the house is the street. Functionally, the front of the house is the public beach. So all of this area here in front of the house, which you see there, is actually public beach and has no uh, privacy in the conventional definition. The private areas of the house are back here and of course don't have the view but do have the privacy from 
the public as well as from the majority of the weather which comes off, including hurricanes, which comes off the, uh, the ocean. We have a, a building code, which is a combination of several codes, but principally it has to be all done in masonry and reinforced every 12 feet with a column grid or tie beams on the top and bottom to resist 40 pounds of square foot wind loads. It's not that dissimilar from here, but it is uh, the hurricane code, what they call in Florida. We have uh, solar collectors for domestic hot water. We did not manage to provide air conditioning from solar power on this project, nor the larger falling one, because there was no possibility to discharge the heat. And it was calculated that it was taking as much energy to discharge the heat as it would take to save it. And th the cost of the solar system was about the same cost as the construction cost for the total project. Here, uh, just very briefly, you see the view to the ocean looking at it from the south. So what we try to do, of course, is try to protect the glass areas with uh, sun shading devices. And uh, while in the north, which is this here, which is the private area of the house, the private outdoor area, which uh, is here an extension of the kitchen for a, like a sun porch, as you would find in, 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 in hot climates, even in this country in the Midwest, and a balcony on the, on, from the top occupants of the house off here. I do white models because I like the shadows too and also because the white is very useful there because it reflects a lot of sun. This is again a similar view looking from the ocean. This is a view looking from the northwest of the site. Here you see the 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 special elements which comprise the composition or the elements or pieces of the house and that piece which creates the glue and holds hopefully the house aesthetically as well as the family together. This is a view looking the opposite direction. The staircase in this case is required by code. You have to have two means of egress from a second level, not only from a third level like here. This uh, project here is a project we're doing in West Lo Los Angeles. And uh, the intentions here are to provide